we will get started. I know that everyone who is registered isn't quite with us yet, but again, because this is recorded, thankfully people will be able to catch up. Thank you all for joining us this evening for this webinar. Unpacking a PISA experiences during COVID. This is the first in a series of webinars that we'll be hosting between Ten Acre Country Day the Chestnut Hill School and the Carroll School. And we are so excited to be able to present this to you tonight. And so thank, so thankful, excuse me, to our panelists for joining us this evening and really being vulnerable and sharing their stories. So I'll get started introducing myself. The other hosts will introduce themselves and then we'll give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves before we get into the questions. So my name is Jalisa Anselm. I am the DEI director at Ten Acre Country Day School. This is my first year at Ten Acre and hopefully first of many years at Ten Acre. But it's probably about my seventh or eighth year doing DEI work in independent schools. My name is Karen Hines. I am the director of diversity, equity and inclusion at the Chestnut Hill School. Um, like Jalisa, I'm also completing my first year but um, one in eight years in independent schools doing um, DEI work. Hello everyone, good evening. I'm Osa Osaige. I am the Director of Equity and Inclusion at the Carroll School. And um, this would be probably my fourth or fifth year um, doing this work in schools. Um, we're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for coming. So now we'll give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves and then we'll launch into our questions. So I'm just going to go across my screen. So Susan and then Rico and then Melissa. Hi, everyone. I am Susan Yao. I am the middle school head at Friends Academy um, in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. And uh, this is my third year as middle school head. It's my 11th ish year in independent schools um, working in different capacities. Hi all, I'm uh, Rico Suseppo, I'm, uh, I prefer he, him pronouns. Um, I am a ninth grade dean uh, here at the Urban School of San Francisco. Uh, so I'm coming to you from the West Coast. Uh, this is my 20th year as an educator and I spent the first uh, 10 years of my, my career at Boston College. So I was really happy that Karen and Jalisa and Osa reached out. So, um, uh, my heart is uh, over there with all of you in Boston, even though I love the weather better out, out here in California. <laughs> and I have, uh, after I was at Boston College, I've been in uh, the independent school world for the last 10 years doing DEI work. Hi everyone, I'm Melissa Lawler, um, she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion at Brewster Academy. Um, I'm really glad Rico went first and named his number because I was feeling like the old lady of the group for a second. Um, this is my, I'm completing my 16th year in independent schools. Um, this is my 11th at Brewster Academy and my fourth as the director of equity and inclusion. Um, but I am from where Rico is sitting in the San Francisco Bay area. So I feel a bi-coastal tear as well. Um, and next year I will be um, at uh, the Director of Equity and Inclusion at Milton Academy. Well, thank you everyone. So just for your understanding, speaking to our attendees, the way that this will work is for each of our questions, I will read the question and then each of our panelists will provide their answers to the question. Some folks pre-submitted questions. So once we get through the uh, pre-crafted questions, we'll go into those pre-submitted questions. And OSA will also be running the Q&A feature. So if you have a question that you would like to send to our panelists, please type it into the Q&A. And when we get to the end of our um, pre-subscribed questions, OSA will read those out and make sure that our panelists have an opportunity to answer those. So before I launch into our very first question, for people who may be unfamiliar with the term PISA, it stands for Asian Pacific, excuse me, Asian Pacific Islander South Asian. So thinking about the entire continent of Asia and not just thinking about um, East Asia, which often is what people think of when they think of the continent of Asia and the countries on that continent. So for our very first question, 
Can you talk a little bit about the impact or impacts COVID has had on you as an APISA person? And you can also add if you're interested or if you have something to say about this, what the impact of COVID has been in other communities that you belong to as well. So we can follow that same order with Susan and then Rico and then Melissa. I was gonna wait for one of you to start. Um, so, you know, I mean, as someone of Chinese descent, COVID coming from China certainly had a direct impact on me. Um, when I look at the violence, you know, and the comments that have been made this past year, I would say for the most part, I've avoided that. Um, I think where it has impacted me most is the fear, the fear of going out on the street, living in a majority white area. And that's not new to me. That's something I always worry about racism when I'm walking around it, you know, what's, what could happen to me today? Um, but in terms of the direct, you know, racism due to COVID, I think I've received relatively less of it. There was, you know, um, a rumor at my school that we had to investigate um, that seemed anti-Chinese. I was at the grocery store and a white customer was insisting on buying a vitamin not made in China. Um, and so I've been around some of it, but I think it, it has really devastated a lot of Asian American communities and not necessarily me personally. If you look at you know restaurants that are going out of business um, folks who have lost their lives or physically being attacked. Um, and I recently spoke at a student conference and it just broke my heart what students have heard from classmates. You know, I would say that has not, I mean, I'm the disciplinarian, so uh, students aren't saying that to me firsthand, but, you know, a lot of students in our schools, Asian students, um, are hearing racist comments. And I think it's interesting to look at how young those comments begin. I know at my own school, we have students as young as second grade saying, here are things that I've heard. People have asked my family or I've overheard, do you have the China virus? I mean, I would just echo what um, Julius and, and Susan are saying in terms of uh, the way it's affecting our students. And that's, uh, again, it, when you say that, it breaks my heart too. I, I sort of feel like it used to be um, a kind of overt racism where, you know, on the schoolyard, they would um, pull up their eyes and make, you know, racial slurs about uh, folks' eyes. Um, but, you know, what you're saying, Julius, it's, um, it's really hard to hear our students talking about the racism that they, they feel. And um, that's been a real surprise to me. Um, I was thinking about this question. I love the question about um, how it affects me as an individual in addition to my community. Um, and I was thinking during COVID, one thing that was, that's really, it's, it's super important to me. I think it's a um, maybe an, uh, a cultural value of, of, you know, I identify strongly as a Filipino American, as an Asian American, um, folks that I identify strongly as, as a gay man. Um, but really the, that cultural value of family, like it's been really hard to be separate and, and the holidays were hard. I know um, sort of when I felt low during this year being so isolated, I was like, is this just me? Is it a cultural value? Is it just my family? So all these things were swirling around and they were swirling around in the midst of just being depressed. You know, <laughs> My students were depressed. Zoom, we were depressed, like December or January, really hard times. <laughs> you know, the fall had a little bit of energy and then December and January just got really hard and sad. And, you know, in, in my community, um, amongst my family members, um, it's hard to destigmatize mental health. So um, I would just bring that up as sort of Asian Americans and mental health was a real sort of um, thing that struck me that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, I would agree with that, Rico. There, and I've, it's funny, Susan brings up the grocery store because that's exactly where most of my personal fears and experiences have occurred and not just 
not just because I'm in a rural, predominantly white community in New Hampshire, but that, that just seems to be where a lot of people feel like they can just walk up to you in an aisle and, you know, say something rude or offensive or whatever. That I don't know what it is. And then maybe it's just because that's the only place I've ever been in COVID. You know, we're not going up everywhere anymore. Um, and, you know, I think about, we're a boarding school, ninth through, ninth through PG boarding school. And when COVID hit last uh, winter into spring, um, a lot of our Asian students had to make a decision to either try to stay in the country um, through the summer um, and try to find a place like a homestay within our community, or they had to go home and be basically locked out of the country and away from their friends here, away online at um, you know different times of the day from when their friends were awake, um, and you know. I've got four year seniors online who are heartbroken about not being able to graduate with their class. And that has been some emotional navigation and some real, real pain um, in the international side. Um, my Asian American students have a variety of experiences in town. Um, they talk a lot about getting yelled at on the street or um, thinking uh, people can just, you know, go right up to them and, and shift blame. We're in a predominantly red state now. So that has, has really impacted things a great deal. Um, on a personal note, I, I think Rico, I, so I identify as Filipina, just like Rico and first gen. So um, that being across the country away from my family has been heart wrenching. Um, and thinking about like my, my family members who are on the front lines, essential workers. Um, we have so many uh, medical staff in our community, um, delivery folks in my immediate family who are directly impacted and not super protected when it comes to um, exposing themselves or their families. And that has been really tough to watch um, from afar. Thank you all and Melissa, I particularly appreciate you sharing the piece about international students, because I think that they can get so left out and forgotten in the conversation, really thinking about the fact that when the pandemic started here in, at least here in Massachusetts, for a lot of independent school students, that was right around when spring break was. So for some of those students, they were not able to go home for spring break. They were not able to go home for the summer and thinking about the toll that the pandemic itself has taken on those students, and then you add the anti-Asian violence added onto that, just really compounds that experience. So I really appreciate you speaking to that point specifically. So for our second question, how have your intra-racial and cross-racial interactions shifted or remained the same over the past year? I'm really thinking about um, showing up in different BIPOC spaces and what that may have looked like for you all. Can we switch up the order or? For <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I, I, I want to say for the majority of showing up in any BIPOC space, the, the, even the word showing up as an Asian American um, feels loaded because I have felt as an Asian American in the BIPOC spaces many times invisible and not because of something that others are doing. It's just that um, often that is both a cultural piece and um, the way so much of the focus in American conversation um, seems to be binary. Um, and, and I think when um, COVID hit and this uh, many, many people were impacted uh, by anti-Asian sentiments, anti-Asian hate crimes, et cetera. It was sort of this fog that lifted around um, Asian American identity where we recognized um, in the reckoning that was the summer of 2020, um, so many similar threads that had been dividing us maybe unconsciously for so long. So I do feel like now there's more efforts 
for intercultural dialogue where we want to come together in solidarity around um because really we're talking about a common uh like a common oppressor and a com a common enemy no and that's not the right word it's more of like a we're all trying to uh, to combat white supremacy in the end so that's what we're really working on and it's so important to name it for what it is so thank you So the day after the Atlanta shooting, um, where most of the victims were Asian women, I got these text messages from white friends and friends I hadn't talked to in years. You know, I'm thinking of you. Not even like I'm thinking of racism or I'm thinking of, you know, anti-Asian violence today, but just this vague thinking of you. And, you know, I could feel this desire to reach out and do something, but also, it, if you haven't built that relationship of solidarity ahead of time, it's really hard in crisis to build that. And so I don't think those relationships got any closer. I, I think that will take time. And I think the relationships that were already built, um, mostly with other folks of color, I think those remained strong and allowed us to, you know, have conversations like this and, um, try and work together. So I feel that desire for more solidarity, but it's hard in crisis to build solidarity when it, if it didn't already exist. And that's such an important point, I think, when incidences of white supremacy or racism come up, there is sort of that impetus for folks to reach out and say, thinking of you, or, you know, this is on my mind, you've been on my mind. And to your point, Susan, when you haven't done the relationship building before that, it makes it really hard to authentically have those conversations, especially if that safety doesn't feel like it's there, particularly in a time where you're feeling really unsafe for very valid reasons. I, I mean, I would, I would just echo what everyone's taught, saying, you know, the, the texts are, are coming from a place of um, the intent is good. You know, we, we all know intent versus impact. So the intent is, is to care for us and to look out for um, your folks who you may know as, as Asian American, um, but we may not have authentic relationships. I love that that you're pointing that out, um, Jalisa and, and Susan, we haven't talked to you for years. So it, it ring, may ring a little hollow, you know, and I, you know, I, I think about how I learn a lot from my, um, Black and African American friends, you know, and that's one group that I really miss connecting with when, you know, George Floyd happened, when Armand Aubrey was happening, you know, I, I want to listen and support them how they want to be supported. I want to let the students lead how they want to lead. I don't want to ask them to do work. Um, so in some ways, um, it's it's kind of like I, I don't know if it's a double issue. I don't know what the cliche is. Like I always say, my parents are Filipino, and I'm not good with cliches. I'm like this pot and kettle and something black, right? So I never know any cliches. But like the thing about <laughs> them reaching out, I was saying, I was thinking about what we were saying, Susan. I was like, yeah, that happened. And why why was my reaction as an Asian American really kind of pissy? Like it wasn't like it wasn't like thank you for looking out for me and caring for me. It was a little pissy, you know, and you know, when you talk to your friends that you have authentic relationships, as you're talking about, Jalisa, who are Asian American, this was not a surprise to anyone. This was not a surprise to us. And, and I don't say that casually. I don't say it dismissively. I say in a way that, you know, you have a question later on about, about what led to this. You know, we all, all Asian Americans had been hearing it for the past year, China flu and Kung flu and China virus. So like we knew there were thousands of incidents of Asian American hate, like we knew it. So it was kind of like, like, why is this? I, I guess I'm in some sense, you know, it's, it's that double-edged sword, I think, whatever the cliche is. Like, I'm happy the conversation is happening, right? I'm glad that it's a national conversation. I'm glad that this panel, and this isn't a critique of you, I'm glad this panel is happening. Um, but in some senses, it's like, Where's everybody been? You know, Melissa's talking about, you know, it becomes a binary, which is, you know, it's not black and white. It's actually all in service, like you're saying, Julie, so of white supremacy. So, you know, if we just say casually white supremacy, it, it, it's, it, it can sort of bring up some rankles. But I think with Black Lives Matter, with the anti-Asian hate that's been happening, um, 
people were understanding like things that we, we don't want to do oppression Olympics. We just want to see our friends and stand in solidarity, but we actually want to talk about white supremacy. Like that's the problem right there. Sorry, my little rant. No, your rant was perfect. And it's so true. All of these things are byproducts of white supremacy. And yes, when we name it as white supremacy, there are those wrinkles, particularly for folks who are not as versed in the work and feeling like this is uh, attacking people who identify as white. And it, I think it's really important to identify that what we are naming here in this space is the system of oppression that is white supremacy, not individual white people. And I think it's so important to name that in this space as a means of having these conversations in really authentic ways. And I, I'm thinking so deeply right now about your point, Rico, and how for many BIPOC folks, the last year has not been surprising in the least. I mean, we are today at May 17th, eight days from the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. And as difficult as that was for me to watch as a black person, I remember when people did reach out similarly to what you were describing, Susan, feeling like I haven't talked to you in years. Why are you reaching out now? And two, this is horrible and horrific and tragic. And it's not in the least surprising. What would be surprising is if there were actual accountability. And I remember thinking that even back then, like, will this be any different? Because the only difference I'm seeing here in this space is that it was recorded and people saw it. And lots of people saw it because we all know that things have been recorded in the past. And I think at least from my vantage point, it's been very similar with the anti-Asian hate crimes that have been happening. I think it's also important to note if I, I could put you back to Lisa on your ter the term white supremacy, supremacy as like a lot of people tend to come, you know, take a step back or because they're sort of equating it with the hood and Ku Klux Klan outfit, you know, and that's not what we're really saying, but that is the association that people have built. So um, I think when we think about white supremacy, I always think about white normative culture and what are the norms and who is expected to be in the norms. And if we're thinking about white supremacy from a very elementary level, that's what I often say will help guide whatever thinking I have um, around what are the systems that are dictating the norms. Thank you so much for that. So over the past year, the national rhetoric, and we've really we've already started unpacking this a little bit tonight, around the COVID-19 pandemic quickly shifted the blame onto people of a piece of descent. And my question for you all is: what's your take on why it was so easy for Asian identified people to be scapegoated? Well, I think this is um you know, seen so many times in history that if um, Asians are never seen as American, then anything that happens in Asia is automatically connected to us and our fault. And so folks who are looking for, you know, if they're not going to go to China, they're going to find Chinese Americans and other piece of folks um, to take their anger out on. And so this I mean, there are many historical examples, um, one of the most notable being the death of Vincent Chin in the 1980s, that Detroit auto workers who had been laid off um, and were angry at Japanese car companies uh, murdered a Chinese man. Um, and so this, you know, seeing us as foreigners makes it really easy. And it doesn't matter where you're born, it doesn't matter how well you assimilate, it doesn't matter um, how good your English is. It's this view that we are foreigners and we are we will always be connected to these countries where our ancestors are from. I'll just pick up on what, what's talking about with you know the perpetual foreigner. So um, you know I, I would I would encourage folks to any any folks when they sort of have a, an impression of an Asian person like 
oh, this Asian person speaks perfect English, or you know that that checking that that sort of question and the immediate reaction and that bias, really the implicit bias. But you know the way that that um, Asian Americans throughout history, as we talking about, have been characterized as perpetual foreigners is not new. So once we have more ethnic studies courses, more Asian American studies courses, we know like the Yellow Peril was real, the perpetual foreigner was real. We know that we have a, a history in, in in our country, in the United States, of um, uh, of anti-immigration laws against Asians. So um, Asians were the only group that were explicitly named um, in um, uh, Chinese exclusionary laws. So like, this is not new. Um, this is not new. And I would also add on uh, and, and, and you know, probably piss off some of your, your groups, um, Julissa and Osa and Karen, I apologize. But, but it was, uh, you know, it was um, 45 who, ha who started this rhetoric most recently, right? So um, I would say, uh, the China virus, I think the Kung flu, these are dog whistles, and that it was, um, this is not sort of anti-Trump, this is factual, that the way he characterized Asian Americans um, at the outset of, the, of COVID really led to, again, the thousands of anti-Asian hate, um, the murder of six Asian women, like it was, it was, the dotted line is not that hard to trace. You know, and so I hope that I'm not saying something that that is 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 very controversial. Um, I, I feel like I'll pause there. I'll pause there. I will say, Rico, that we had students that pointed that out as well. Yeah, I'm curious as to what the students can make the the connection. I, I mean, I coming from a psychology background and and thinking about how it's human nature to want to blame or find a reason for things that happen or when we lose privileges, there needs to be someone to blame for that. And I think that that, to, for our brains to settle, we need to attribute this virus to someone, to a face. It might not be a face that had COVID, but it sure looks like the ones that we are blaming universally. So I think, scapegoat is is it was easy to uh, trace it at least from a from a COVID perspective but I think when you think about how deeply ingrained this is in our our own country's history about you know layered in that perpetual foreigner is who gets citizenship and who doesn't and how that that layer contributes to anti-Asian sentiment or anti, uh, you know, there, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, history that I think folks, some folks are just beginning to uncover. Um, and, and that, you know, PBS released an amazing docu-series, Asian Americans. And I think for so long, People have this image that Rico, Rico was talking about, about like when, when somebody says Asian, what pops into your head? Is it a Filipino person? Probably not. Is it a South Asian person? So thinking about like those, those associations, right? There's not, there's, there's not a whole lot of connection if, if these are not familiar to you. And that really goes back to the beginning when I was explaining the term of Pisa and really thinking about the continent of Asia and all of the countries that are part of that continent. But then looking at um, the countries or the people from the countries that get most scapegoated. It's always really interesting depending on what the conflict or what have you is. That piece is always really interesting to me. And, so, and to Rico's point, how implicit bias shows up in spaces. And I think in unpacking things like this in these sorts of ways is one way that we can start chipping away at that. But we also need to be thinking about more and what else can we do? And I know that those are some of the questions coming through the chat. People are wondering, what more do we do? So our next question was, What's the connection between the stop Asian hate and other racial justice movements like Black Lives Matter? How do we build solidarity amongst folks who identify as a PISA and other communities of color?
I mean, the elephant in the room here is going to be that white supremacy piece. That, that is the thing that um, we all need to be united in trying to dismantle and overturn. And many, many folks in our communities have a very different relationship to white supremacy than, uh, so we can't often unite because there are so many um, uh, places in which, uh, for example, in the Asian community, Asian and Asian American community, there's so much, uh, so there's so much uh, internalization of the modern, uh, the model minority myth, right? So, like I think about my parents and how they felt like they had to lose their accent, they had to not teach their daughters Tagalog. They had to make sure that everything about them blended in so perfectly that their proximity to whiteness could not be denied. And so I think about them in that same umbrella category that I am in, in which I can recognize certain elements of white supremacy that are being enacted on our community, but they might not be able to. So I think about the ways in which that are a, a, a piece of community needs to recognize that in ourselves and also reach reach out for our community with our, you know, our black, black Latinx communities as well, our BIPOC communities. So I feel like there, there needs to be some in-group work as well as some out-group work. You go. No, you go. <laughs> there's, there's the polite Asian. You, you go. <laughs> I have a, I have a, a joke with one of my colleagues, and and she is Chinese, and she's always like looking at me, and she's like, Rico, you go. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna wait for you to go. Um, I'm gonna jump in, Caesar, because I always have a lot to say. Um, really quickly, I mean, I would say, <clears throat> learning what solidarity is. Um, Melissa talked about um, intra-Asian, you know, um, uh, talking to elders, talking to family members, saying what anti-Blackness is. You know, I, I had a very difficult conversation um, when Black Lives Matter was happening with my brother. And he said to me, you know, what is it that got, what has that got to do with us? You know, why would you be out there protesting and why, why would you put your, your, your life in danger, right? It's like, they're not following the rules. And so those are really difficult conversations to start, to sustain um, with people that you love. So I think um, within Asian families, that's something that isn't often talked about. Um, I think uh, amongst people of color, like showing up and, and teaching students to show up. So um, just as much as I want to talk about anti-Blackness in the Asian community. I want my Black brothers and sisters to talk about anti-Asianness, you know, and let's have a conversation together. So let's have a forum like this where we can um, have cross-cultural um, dialogue and talk about it openly. Um, and, you know, as part of that is, is what's the role of our uh, uh, why anti-racist educators or students, right? So what role do they have and how are they letting uh, POC or BIPOC folks lead, right? So are they putting people in front and sort of hanging behind? So a lot of these things, um, all of us in this room, everyone's nodding because we've been doing this work, but how do we share that work and, and, and get people sort of the language and the foundations to talk about it? Like as an educator, that's really important to me. So, um, you know, within the family, having the conversations at schools, being in the community um, and, also thinking about different kinds of activism. It's not always just, um, you know, being out in the streets. Some, some folks don't feel comfortable that way. So what ways is it that you're having a conversation? Um, what ways are you supporting, you know? So when um, uh, I can't be in Atlanta and, you know, I was, I was really sort of upset when, when um, the six Asian women were killed. And then I saw on social media, somebody's like, here's the group that's been doing the work in, in Atlanta. So, you know, can I send them 20 bucks? Yes, to me, that's activism. That's activism. So um, different methods at, at different times and, and thinking about all these kind of things. Yeah, I think um, our movements are very much connected and they have to be connected. Um, you know, there are quotes much more elegant than I can give about how our liberation is tied up in each other's. 
And so we have to fight all of them at the same time. We absolutely do. And actually what Rika was just talking about leads us in to one of the pre-submitted questions, which was, what are the ways that people can support a piece of people, particularly one in public? So I think that question is really pointing to when you are seeing incidents of racism or violence or bigotry, what are the ways that when you see those things out in public, you can act? particularly for some folks who may be fearful of stepping in and saying or doing something? Literally anything. <laughs> you know, I think sometimes people are so afraid, and I've talked to white friends in particular who are so afraid of, you know, not being the white savior, not stepping on my toes. And, you know, I think you have to interrupt it because it so there's something hurting the community. You're not stepping in because you're trying to save me from racism personally. Um, and if you truly believe that we don't accept whatever this behavior is in our community, uh, I, I hope it's not so difficult to act. And you know, it might just be a face that you make. It might just be a sound. One of the most effective tools, you know, if we're not talking about physical violence, is making the moment awkward for the person who has said or done something racist. You know, just a, literally anything you do in the moment will open up a possibility um, of a different outcome for that interaction. And in school settings, particular, the one, so I do workshops around building solidarity, and the one, the setting that keeps coming up when you talk about public. Um, racism is the faculty meeting, is just being alone at a faculty meeting. It is a terrible feeling. It doesn't matter how many people come, after, come up to you afterwards and say, thank you for saying something, or wow, that was terrible. It's sort of like the text messages, right? I'm thinking of you. Well, I needed you in the moment in a public way. And yeah, it's risky. And that's why I needed you there. I think it, I, I was just thinking as you were talking, Susan, that the worst possible thing is for something to happen and then for someone to come up to me afterwards and say, well, that sucked or whatever. And you just stand across from them kind of with your slack jaw and say, where were you for that? You know, like, I think that that, that that silence speaks so heavily in and inaction speaks so heavily. And I'm not asking people to get on a like anti-racism treadmill and run themselves into the ground. I'm what I'm asking is for that awareness to be present when in that moment. You know, you can't be that person, the worst person in a racial emergency, you know, because that is going to really have a have a significant impact on the outcome. So I, I think about like the silence I experienced after the Atlanta shootings from my own school community. And I was in pain after those shootings and I had to write the email and gather the resources mm. and send them out. And that was the last place I wanted to be. But I, what I was really hoping for were any of my white colleagues or any of my colleagues really to say, hey, I found these resources. I'm going to compile the document. I got you. That's all. It could have been an email, could have been a text, like, let me handle it. Let me take some of it. That silence and inaction was brutal. I feel that so deeply, just from my own perspective, dealing with the George Floyd murder at this time last year and in my former community, I think the two things that came up the most for me were one, being in a faculty meeting to Susan's point and basically just sobbing for the whole 45 minutes and having one person send me a text and say, get off of this call right now. I'm dropping you off dinner. And so thankful to that human. And I thought about the 29 other people on the call. 
And then in that same vein, there was a morning that I woke up and uh, words just poured out and I wrote this poem and I sent it to my adult community and it was reported back to me that people cried and it was really moving, heard from no one. That silence, it really is deafening. It really, really is. I think Rico, you were about to say something. <laughs> you know, the, the sort of, I'm still thinking about the silence that, that all of you are talking about. And instead of the text message from our, our friends who are white allies, you know, we need you to talk to other white folks. <laughs> Just that's what we need. And <clears throat> I think one of the things that we talked about at, as an administration at my school um, when, when these things happen is I appreciate my current school offers um, folks space and says, can we take a class for you? right? Can we, do you need to take care of your, do self-care today, right? And it's a part of the administration's ethos for our faculty and staff of color, you know, and that's to me really powerful to say from our head of school, you know, um, how can we care for you? We can care for you in this way, right? So like, Jalisa, if you can't do this meeting, and, and they say in a very public way at the beginning of the faculty meeting, some folks are not here because they can't be here today, you know, and, and name it. That to me is really powerful. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I kind of lost track of the other thread. I don't know what the other question was. Yeah, there's the, there's the violence of the inaction in the moment. And then there's the violence of like, all right, let's move on. Today's a normal day now. And you need to do the work. Like, Susan, you're Asian, you know, you're the affinity group leader. Melissa, can you come up with some resources? It's like, that's actually not the last thing we want to do today. Like, like I'm still grieving over the woman down the street in, in Oakland, the 79 year old woman, Asian woman who was beat today. Like it, you know, I was, I was in tears. I can't, I can't come up with, with resources. <laughs> that's what Google is for. The power of Google. <laughs> I led a faculty meeting a couple of weeks ago around um, microaggressions in our adult community. And it was one of the things that came to me was the clip from Blackish, I think, probably right at the beginning of the season, where Dre is playing that clip. Instead of asking your BIPOC friends, go to Google. Google is a wonderful tool. And for folks who often say, well, it's a wonderful tool, but it can lead you down that rabbit hole, Google Scholar is a wonderful thing. It will definitely guide you in the places you're hoping to go. And I think there's this really big misunderstanding that often happens in independent schools where when these acts of violence happen, that schools too often lean just on their DEI directors or their diversity teams, or if there is a lack of those, then just their BIPOC folk. And it is so important for schools to step in in those moments and say, let me take this off your plate because this is not a time where you should have to do this work. This is a time for us to do our work. So, so important to name that. As Melissa, similarly to you last year, I just said, no. It's like, nope, I'm not. And thankfully I did have some colleagues who stepped up and said, you shouldn't have to. We will put together the Padlet. We will send out these resources. Please stop sending her emails asking her for help because <laughs> I have told her not to respond. So it's wonderful to have those, um, those people in your life who are able to do that. But how amazing would it be if that was overwhelmingly your community? So that's what we do. So we have one last question before we shift to the Q&A. And that final question was, Oops, sorry. Do you feel a bridge between various Asian ethnic communities? Again, so going back to that thread of really thinking about the continent of Asia and how many countries are inclusive or are included in that. I, I think the solidarity has been growing with every wave of anti-Asian violence. Um, I, I don't know what solidarity was like in the 1800s, um, but, you know, Vincent Chin's death was significant because a Chinese man was killed because of anti-Japanese sentiment. Um, and so I think 
you know, during the civil rights movement, during the last few decades, um, violence against Muslims and South Asians after 9-11, I think there has been growing solidarity among ethnic communities. And I recently attended a, a Buddhist memorial service for the victims of the Atlanta shooting. And it was very intentional. It was um, multiple ethnic Buddhist groups represented, you know, Thai, Chinese, Japanese, Sri Lankan, Vietnamese, um, very intentional and, and beautiful in that way. Um, I, I think the, the question is, is a complicated one. Um, is there a bridge across the Asian uh, communities? I, I think about how there's one slide I have in, in, in my slide deck and it, it's um, that the Asians, Asian Americans are not monolithic, right? We know this, we shouldn't essentialize. We, you know, there's more than hundred plus ethnicities within Asian American umbrella. There's more than 400 languages spoken, right? Someone who's a new immigrant um, from Laos is not the same as someone who has generations here, you know, Chinese or Japanese or Filipino. So when we start to lump um, Asian Americans together, that that's uh, problematic. Um, and, and we just always have to disaggregate the data. So I don't think that's necessarily the question that's being asked. You know, how do you have a bridge amongst Asian communities? Um, even within, you know, me being Filipino, I have to learn about what it means to be um, South Asian and Daisy. Like I, I, I have an open ear and I have enough humility to say to my friend, Nayantara, can you explain to me? You know, like, like we're all Asian, but you need to like help me understand the difference. And, and so that, that is a big dose of, of humility, I think, that I have to be open to and understand that, that you know, maybe it's time to retire the term Asian American, right? Like one of the things we do in my Asian American literature class is we ask, is this term viable? Like, let's learn first the history of yellow power movement in the 60s and say, okay, this was a pol explicitly political term, Asian American, so that we could have more um, uh, political power at Berkeley and, and UC Santa Barbara. And in this day and age, who's being left out of this Asian umbrella? So is it time to retire it, right? So, you know, we were having conversations when we brought this, uh, when you brought all of us together, Shalisa and Osan Karen, it's like, you know, is it Apisa, is it Apida, is it Asian American? You know, so it, it's like any of these evolving identities. Um, and I think that more conversation is, is useful rather than less. So, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think there's, a bridge that exists right now. Like, I don't think enough of my Philippine X brothers and sisters show up. <laughs> I don't think they show up at, at, um, at uh, other Asian ethnicities protests or um, conversations. And, and I'm not sort of faulting them. There's just not enough conversation. It's like, oh, we think of, unless I talk about it, it's Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Like, that's who, that's what I used to think of. And when I grew up in a predominantly white, institution, like I didn't know where I fit in as a Philippine person. Yeah, I, I used to chafe at the term Asian American, um, you know, and I, I always, I have so much Filipino pride that it's really hard to, um, to be included in a blanket term, I think. I, I think it must be somewhat, um, uh, Sometimes I used to think of it as like, it, it's because we essentially are fourth or fifth place of like the rank order of thinking about um, Asian, who, who are the dominant Asian American groups. Um, I always used to, to, it always used to rankle me a little bit. But now in terms of the things, when I see, you know, stop A AAPI hate, when I see, um, solidarity movements start to form in a different context and in a different way. I feel that, I felt that Atlanta shooting so deeply, even though those victims were Korean, I still felt it very deeply because um, that just felt like a direct hit on our community, whether you were Filipino, whether you were Thai, whether you were um, from Bangladesh, whatever it is. Um, and so, I think that it, it, it takes those, it unfortunately takes these movements and moments for us to solidify. And then it, sometimes we drift apart 
again, only to solidify again. So it's like this, this lack of continuity that we often feel um, from moment to moment that can really shift the bridge or the need for a bridge sometimes. That lack of continuity is so important, really specifically thinking about, you know, in a year from now, what do things look like? Do people forget again until something else happens? And I think to the point that you all made earlier in not being surprised by a lot of what has happened, I think the reason that people are sometimes surprised is because of that lack of continuity. Oh, this is over, we've, we've fixed this. So now we can move forward. And unfortunately, things don't necessarily get fixed. A situation can shift and change, but it doesn't mean that the larger oppressive system has been dealt with. So we're actually at the point in our evening where we are going to shift to the Q&A. So I'm going to kick, kick it to Osa and she's gonna lead us through our Q&A. Okay, so um, the question that is coming up um, and this is for anyone on the panel, um, goes back to something that was talked about around this idea of sending a text message in a moment of crisis and how that um, doesn't translate in maybe the way that the person intended it to be. So the question really is, if you do wanna reach out to a friend in a moment of social um, distress, uh, how do you express compassion and concern and really invite a relationship um, to continue to build without necessarily putting that particular person um, within like the role as an educator? Um, what are some ways that you can show up authentically um, beyond while talking to other white um, people? Is there any way that you can express um, some authentic, you know, concern? And so anyone's welcome to answer that question. So part of me wants to say, if you haven't built a relationship, I think Rico called an authentic relationship, one where we already have racial solidarity, there's sort of nothing you can do in the moment. Crisis is not the time, right? If I'm grieving and, and you have to sit with that, that you haven't built that relationship before this moment, that you cannot offer support or space in that moment. And that's where I think the public letters and the public social media posts, that, that is something you can do. Educating other people is something you can do in that moment, but you're not someone I can lean on during a racial crisis. I, I would add that, you know, there's, there's a lot of best-selling books out there. One is called White Fragility. You know, it's, you, you have, I, I would not discourage anyone from doing that, but the, the response you receive may not be the response that you want, right? So for a friend that I haven't talked to in 10 years texting me saying, are you okay? Well, I'm obviously not okay. Like, we are not okay, right? Like, I know that when I'm talking to my Black friends, like, they are not okay. Right. So it's not a, it's that that does very little for them. <laughs> it, it, it's it's, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to discourage and, and still do it. Right. So but you may not get the response that you want. Um, that 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 sort of gesture is is more about you than the friend. And to build a little bit on what Susan's talking about, like the the work that you can do to push the movement forward is having conversations with your white friends right with your white family about why it's important right still send that text and then don't be upset if i'm like oh thanks like one word <laughs> or just like some emoji because i haven't talked to you for years so it's not about being offended that i'm, I'm not responding and saying thank you it's about um what are you what are you actually doing to push things forward to, to make change right? to me that's more effective like go to the you know start with ibram candy and Get yeah, white fragility. It's not that hard. I I would probably be in the minority on if I've heard if I've had a good relationship with that friend, but I haven't. Maybe if we've drifted apart, and they reached out. I I actually um, went back into my text to see if I had you know like kind of an analysis of 
of who had who I hadn't heard from and it was like I heard from some colleagues at a school where I haven't taught in you know 11 years and um the best part about that text was hey I'm thinking about you I know it's been a long time no uh I just wanted you to know I'm thinking about you no need to respond and that last part was everything because it doesn't put you put it didn't put me in the role of tell me about how you feel so that I can feel good about reaching out and it wasn't like they said tell me everything you know about what I should read it wasn't a laundry list of what she was reading in order to combat racism or a, or a resume of what she was doing it was just hey I'm thinking about you naming that it had been a while not an excuse no need to respond and it was like just a an easy way for her to say, I'm with you if you want to be with me. No, I really appreciate that point, Melissa, because I think part of the work of being an ally or accomplice, um, co-conspirator, however you identify, um, part of that work is really understanding your position. And I think also recognizing that this is sustained work over time, right? And um, I think for folks who, um, folks can identify like people who they know are really are committed and, and are doing this in a, in a way that isn't self-serving or, you know, doesn't necessarily want to put somebody in that particular position to kind of emote in that moment. But um, those little signals, whether it's ongoing or, you know, that text message that doesn't necessarily require you to respond is so helpful. And so... Um, I think also as, you know, as Black, Indigenous, and other folks of color, like, part of our job is to really self-advocate and recognize, like, we are not obligated to respond in, in those moments. Like, that is okay. It is very much okay for me to not respond necessarily in that moment. It's also very much okay for me to respond in two weeks, right, um, and follow up and saying, you know, I thank you for, for reaching out and, um, and maybe not even having that conversation about what's going on in, in that moment, but, you know, again just giving you that agency to decide if and when and how um so it's so helpful thank you so much for sharing that um so i'm mindful of our time so i'm wondering if we continue on um as panelists is there anything that you all would like to share with us that we haven't discussed tonight i know we could honestly talk for hours um and we we barely even you know dipped our toenails into the into the to the meat of the you know the issues, but what are some things that you think um, would be so helpful for folks to know um, as we um, begin to wrap up? You go, Rico. <laughs> I'm looking at my colleagues, I'm happy to look ready, Rico. Go for it. I got thrown off. <laughs> I, I I'm thinking the one thing I uh, that that I would like to sort of share and and uh, sort of um, spotlight is that there's probably parents on the call. So I, I'm thinking about those parents at um, Chestnut Hill and Ten Acre. Um, I'm thinking about how they may have, um, especially if they're a parent of color, they're they're worried about their child and in. in apparently my institution and having one or two and being the only, right? Um, I, I think they should know that that folks are looking out for their kids, right? All these three amazing things, people who, who organize this panel, um, all of us have sat in that in this DI seat. So um, I have a, a particular eye on my African-American, my kids of color in the second grade. Like I know who's the teacher, I know um, what's going on. So I, I just want, parents to feel um, that they know the three of you are there anytime <laughs> that they want to reach out to you. And I think that's super important. I think that there, that when, 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 like last year before I started at Urban, I was dealing with the second grade and, and they had the N-word on the playground, right? So someone is thinking of this and I want the, the parents to come talk to me, right? So I'm helping the administration respond to that in a way that is, is as best as I can do. Um, but I don't want those 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 families to feel like that they're not included, right? That they can't, you know, that they they should be grateful for their for their place at the table. You know, it's sort of like 
you as a family of color, you as students of color are a full part of these independent school communities. Like once you, you know, we can do the talk, like they weren't built for us. They were a bit built for rich white boys, right? That's the literal history of independent schools. And now that the door has been opened, um, we should we should just feel whole and full and that you have people here to support you. I think in terms of, I, I think a lot about, I love that you spoke to the parenting side and a lot of uh, parents that I speak to, um, a lot of white parents in particular that I speak to are, are stuck in this cycle of, I need to do something. What do I do every time one of these things occurs or, um, and, and I go back to the, you know, thinking about the little things that white families can do that often don't, they don't do because either that's not something that they had previously done. They didn't feel comfortable about it. They sort of shelved it for a while. And I think when we talk about um, things like white supremacy, how often is that coming up in white family conversation? Because it comes up a lot for us, but how often are, are because our kids can feel it and our kids recognize racial differences as early as three. That's the psych teacher talking to me again, but that's where, it, that's where it occurs. So, you know, if you have kids in that age, in the age who are, are above, they're definitely seeing difference. They're definitely recognizing. And so how are you, um, how are you addressing that? And, and what I think, what I've recognized at least um, societally is we always have this need to be right or correct, right? We, want, we always wanna be right or correct. And, and that has polarized us quite a bit in terms of what is right and what is correct. And sometimes the desire for that to not make a mistake leads to inaction. And that piece has been, you know, if I want to communicate one thing to families on this call um, in terms of doing is making sure that folks feel like um, that they can do the little things within their own spheres of influence that then directly ripple out. So even if it's a com an ongoing conversation with one family member or, or a conversation with your child about uh, different structures or reading a book together, whatever it is, um, that's still doing, even though you're not marching, even though you're not out there um, on the front line. That is so helpful, thank you. Um, so a little bit to this point, uh, Rico, you kind of touched on it, but you know, all of you- I'm sorry, I just wanna jump in because I yeah, think go Susan go. was gonna, sorry. Go for it. Um, yeah, I didn't like answer the last question yet. Um, so for me, I, I think what the text message highlight for me is how a lot of us don't know what solidarity is. And maybe we haven't experienced it and we haven't been taught it. And so we're trying, but we haven't quite figured it out. You know, it's sort of like um, democracy. You can't just vote and say, I'm done, I'm a citizen. I voted once and that's it. Um, I feel like with anti-racism work, a lot of people are looking for the checklist. If I do these 10 things, if I read these 10 books, I'm there. But if if you just wanna, you know, check off the list and go back to your life, that's not solidarity and we're not there yet. It's sort of, it's a way of being with other people and taking care of other people and showing up for other people. Yeah, that's that sustained work, right? And um, thinking about how it's ongoing and it really permeates your entire worldview and changes your everyday lived experiences. And so, um, yeah, there's some rigor to that. It's not a, a one and done, but it's, it's continual. So thank you. Um, two questions that are kind of coming out of, from this conversation. One would be, you know, could either of you talk about the ways that, you know, schools in general, or maybe your school specifically are working with white parents um, and even white administrators 
um, around how to really support students. And then on the, the flip side, like how um, do you empower students to speak up? You know, um, Rico, you talked about how you have a special eye towards um, those BIPOC children in these different grades, right? Which is um, just beautiful. But how, how do we help empower students to speak up in these moments that are really tough? And then also how are we kind of holding space um, and accountability for um, white parents and you know colleagues and administrators in our schools? Um, I could speak to the the two things pretty separately. Um, I think about how do we empower students to speak up, and I heard this great podcast, um, "Anti Racism in the Workplace" by Adam Grant, um, and he talks about he interviews a uh, a DEI practitioner in the UK, and he, he mentions that the worst behavior you it, it, the, a community is defined by the worst behavior that community will tolerate and so i think about how do we like when i work with our student leaders i say what is the worst behavior that you think rooster tolerates and how do we rise above that how do we how do we um create a community that we want to be proud of and i and that it, it giving them that um giving them that kind of ownership over that piece of their leadership that's very much within their control because at least at boarding school for ninth through pg kids peer culture is everything and it is it is defined by action and um social response etc so there is how do you make speaking up and anti-racism the thing? How do you make it the norm? Um, is that the culture you want to create? And that's that's the piece with that that I do with students. White, the white parents and white administrators doing affinity work is really complicated in terms of at a boarding community. That's a real stretch for us. I mean, I have on my aspirational goals right behind this computer, um, parent seed group, which is seeking educational equity and diversity. It's a program out of Wellesley. Um, many of our schools have faculty seed groups and student seed groups. Um, and that is one way that we have tried to uh, get at identity work with white parents, because I think that's where you begin. You don't begin in anti-racism, you begin within. So, um, and white administrators doing affinity work with parents, uh, we haven't really gotten to that point yet. So for students, I would say that relationship is so crucial, which I think has been one of our themes all evening, right? Um, having relationship with students of color that they know I'm an ally. They're not gonna assume I'm an ally. You know, LGBTQ students aren't going to assume I'm an ally unless I build that relationship and I'm very public and explicit about uh, my support. Um, and I would say that for the white students too, so that when there's a racial incident, every student involved, trust me, they know that they can come to me, be honest with me, um, and we can actually grow together. Otherwise, things will just go unreported or interventions will be unsuccessful. And so that relationship is so critical. Um, and on the white administrator front, I'll just quickly plug our Summer Institute. I think that that work has not been done in the independent school world. I think there are more and more anti-racist conferences and you see more and more white teachers participating in them. Um, and there isn't a lot for white administrators specifically. There was a, a group for heads in New England that was started this year, um, not only for white heads, I don't think. And then this summer, Friends Academy will be hosting um, a summer institute. That's a week long retreat for white senior administrators. And so I think that's very new work for us to embark on and very, very important work given how much institutional power white administrators have. 
um, I'll pick up on on uh, educating our white administrators in this work. I love the question, Osa. I think um, one of the things that I advise a lot of folks who are new to DI work, especially with, you know, it starts off for POCs who are in the classroom and, you know, we'll give you a little stipend and then we have a part-time DI coordinator and then suddenly they're full-time. And I think asking the right questions is really important. So the questions for me are, um, who's steering the ship? Do you have a DEI director? <clears throat> um, do you have the support of your head of school and board of trustees, right? What kind of education do they need? Um, your school can have as much DEI language out there and, and publicity and admissions, but if they are not sort of um, having somebody steering the ship, not the only sailor on the ship, but like a DI director who is organizing all of the parents who want to do the work, the students who want to do the work, um, that that it's not, it's hard work. So so the, the ship isn't going to sail <laughs> unless unless there's somebody steering it, which, you know, I have great admiration for the three of you. I've been in that, that role. And, and once you learn things like the average tenure of a DI person is two years, then you, you're like, how are they being supported by the head of school? How is the board putting into place, you know, uh, metrics? And, and these are the right questions to ask. It's, it's, it's learning the right questions to ask for, for me. And parents, you know, at my school, one of the reasons I was drawn to this school um, was our, we have a P ideas, um, and, and if anyone wants to be connected with our P ideas folks, it's parents inclusion diversity. Uh, I don't know what the EAS is, but but it's a parent group that's really well attended. That there are many board members on that have a lot of power at our institution, and, and they're um, specifically around diversity. I'd say about half of them are white parents. Um, and they collaborate and support our DI director. So it's not held by one person, all the DI work. It's, it's really kind of amazing. Yeah, to move this needle, it takes a village, right? Um, and so like, it's, I'm loving how there's a common thread in which we're asking for everyone to really um, step in and, and like really hold each other um, through this. And, and, and so it's beautiful to, to kind of hear different strategies and things that are going on in your schools and also like encouraging people on the call and hopefully people who even aren't who are on the call to find a way to plug in and if you don't have something at your school I would say that you should advocate for something right advocate for something to to happen so that way um you know your com community can do that learning together and um you know step in and and, and help support so thank you for that and just in keeping with the ship metaphor we go. An important to question to consider is, is turning a ship like turning the Titanic? Or are like, what are it? What are the mechanisms in place? To, if you need to turn that ship? So just to add on, I just love your ship metaphor. I had to throw that one in there. Too. And we can go with the icebergs. We can keep playing it out. <laughs> On, on a very practical term, uh, you know, another question I asked, and, and this was a change of heads um, when I was the DI director, the only question I had for my head of school was, do you have my back? Because it's hard work. There's so many Titanics and whatever. There's so many metaphors and so many people who will put up roadblocks that the DI directors need the head to have their back. If they're... Um, if they, if they don't have your back, then you will be fed to those that that 20 percent. That's the most, you know, that's in The New York Times complaining about Dalton's DI programs like the, the DI people are, are the ones on the chopping block. So we really need to have a board and a head of school. And I would ask those questions to the board and the head of school. <laughs> are you going to show up and do you have my back? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to get you all in trouble. <laughs> I think parents are a big part of that too, Rico. And just parent support is so integral. Like, uh, and so much understanding, I think, bridges can be built between parents and, um, and DEI directors uh, that is so necessary because a lot of uh, roadblocks that we face are around fear and uh, a lot of 
a lot of uncertainty or a lot of misunderstanding. Thank you. Um, so for the final question before we close out for this evening, um, and I just wanna say thank you once again to all of you. I've learned so much. So I am incredibly grateful for this space. Um, but the final question is, um, you know, during this incredibly challenging time in our history, um, how did people support you? And what further supports do you think um, Apesia people need from allies? So how did people support you? Um, and then what are some ways that you think people can continue to support you um, as we continue to charter these waters? Like you, was, I feel like I, I've, I was learning. I, I love um, Melissa's response earlier. Like um, when you said a text that you received that was helpful to you was no need to respond. Like I agree completely. Like you know, for me, it's it's the conversation and, and learning from each other. Um, you know, I I know my people, so it's like um, if I need to find a time to have. Uh, uh, a happy hour and a drink and to say we're going to do this on zoom and and i can't be with you and close the door so you know that's self-care and and there's no guilt involved even though um uh all of us as bipoc well, i shouldn't speak for anybody me using the i voice i can feel very guilty about um doing self-care and i think that's super important um that's the second part of the question uh what do a piece of folks need specifically i think um we've all the panelists have been talking about this, you know, for Asian Americans, there's an invisibility. So to be a part of the conversation and to break the binary is, is super important um, to, to um, get Asian American and ethnic studies courses uh, really quickly into history and to um, English. Um, I think uh, talking to our Asian families who have um, differing ideas about racial identity development. So I, you know, I've had conversations with Asian families who are like, we are not um, people of color. And, and so, you know, having respect for that and also saying this is the mission what the school is committed to. So we need to educate um, those folks um, who may just see, uh, who, who, who haven't moved beyond a model minority identity. I think, oh, sorry, Susan, go ahead. Um, I think Rico brought it up earlier as far as like, um, uh, how, can, how can a piece of folks be supported by allies? I, he brought up the oppression Olympics. And that is something that I think a lot of folks engage in, maybe unwittingly. Um, in, and pain is pain, you know, like, we have to recognize that pain in communities, it's not, it, you know, it's not who is hurting more, it's that we're hurting. Um, and that it, reframing that as, a, it, it, I think can add to that solidarity piece. Um, I am notoriously bad at self-care and I, um, I don't even know what my self-care is. And that's definitely like an issue for me, but like, for a friend to be like, I think you need dinner dropped off. It's like when you are told you have to go into quarantine, like friends just appear and they start, you know, dropping off stuff they think you might need and whether you take it or not is, is your call. But I think, you know, it's stuff you don't even think about that you just makes, it just makes your load a little less heavy, whether it's emotional, whether it's, um, whether it's physical, I think that piece is huge. Like, you know, sending your video, you know, your your a piece of friend a video of trauma, or you know, sending your black friend a have you seen this video? Like that that is well intentioned, but then you end up re-traumatizing that individual, and and it's it's misplaced good intentions, and then you are sort of de dealing with the fallout of that. I think you know, knowing, getting to know your people on a very, in a, in a non-crisis way, 
right? That's what we were starting with in the beginning. This is an opportunity to build those relationships. This is an opportunity to say, I want to be there for you down the home stretch, you know? And I think, you know, no need to respond. Anyway. Yeah, I think the public declarations of support, that matters. Like my white head sending out multiple letters about anti-Asian violence without me asking or anybody asking, that matters. Um, seeing so many independent schools name white supremacy and Black Lives Matter last summer, that matters. And it's the everyday stuff too. It's, it's not just the public declaration. It has to be backed up by all of the little things. Yeah, it's the and not the ors, right? Yeah. Um, the big and the small is the invisible and the visible. Um, collectively, that is how we, you know, move towards liberation and healing and and, and justice. And so um, thank you all, honestly, for this wonderful evening. I am so full and I'm going to just kind of ruminate on all these things I've heard in the last hour and a half. Um, and I'm really excited that this is um, the first conversation of multiple, like this is incredible that our school communities are coming together. I think this is even a kind of a testimony to some of the action, right? That we keep thinking about like, what can we be doing? Um, working in silos is a big part of inequity, right? And a huge part of oppression. And so I'm, I'm grateful for the cross, the cross community uh, conversations in this moment to even connect with folks across, you know, the West Coast and in different, you know, geographies, like that is such a blessing. So thank you all of you for coming out tonight. And thank you to all the folks who are tuning in. Um, and we look forward to seeing you hopefully again soon and wishing everyone well as we close out towards the end of the school year. And for any of you who are watching this webinar, um, watching the recording of this webinar, please again know that if there are questions that you are having as you are watching this or more things are coming up, for you, please reach out to myself, Osa, or Karen, whoever your school's DEI director is. But thank you again to our panelists. This has been such a full night for me as well, and I have learned so much from the three of you. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.